Um, thanks very much for the invitation to speak as, um, as part of this uh, festival. It's a great uh, pleasure for me to be with you and thanks to all of you who are out there. Um, thanks for coming, nice to see you as it were. Um, so today I'm, uh, I'm going to be talking about the history of Egyptology, which is the subject of um, a, a book what I have written um, and which came out as Claire said at the beginning of um, October, Egyptologist's Notebooks. Um, this is a, a sort of overview history of the development of Egyptology um, from the earliest travellers and explorers, um, the earliest diggers um, through to more recent times, not up to the present day, but to more recent times. Um, and it, it's a story that is told um, through uh, the lives and, and times and accomplishments of 32 Egyptologists um, or 32 people who have made a contribution to Egyptology. Some of them wouldn't probably have regarded themselves as Egyptologists. Some of them were living and working before the word Egyptology and Egyptologist was ever coined. Um, but all of them have made a, a contribution to the field. Um, all of them also left behind um, archives of uh, very beautiful uh, drawings, sketches, maps, plans, notes, letters, etc. So this is intended to be a, a kind of narrative history of the subject of the, uh, um, that I'm a specialist in, Egyptology, but it, it's also a kind of showcase and a platform to show off some, some beautiful um, archival uh, documents as well. So what I want to do today is, in the, in the course of 45 minutes to an hour or so, those of you who have heard me speak, uh, recently will know that I'm dreadful at keeping to time um, but Claire and I had a chat about this beforehand and I'm going to do my best to stick to 45 minutes to an hour and then we'll have time for questions afterwards and um, what I'm going to do is rattle through um, what seem to me to be some of the more important moments in the history of Egyptology some of the more important moments in the story and to touch on some of the more interesting characters in the book show off some of the material that's in the book uh, and it, it is, um, a lot of it is really visually uh, very appealing. Uh, and, um, and then we're going to deal with some of the um, trickier sides of the history of the subject because it would be irresponsible and remiss of me to try and tell the story of the history of Egyptology as if it was all entirely wonderful um, when it is in fact in some respects a little bit um, problematic. Um, so we're going to talk about the good, we're going to talk about the bad, um, and we're going to talk about um, what I've called the ugly, because that's the phrase, isn't it? Good, bad and the ugly. Um, and that is where we're going to touch on the ways in which Egyptology is a kind of colonial discipline and, and why we need to recognise that, understand that, um, and understand why um, that aspect of things is maybe not so good and, and what we need to try to do about this um, in the future. So here is the cover of this book, Egyptologist Notebooks. Um, so 200 years of, of Egyptology. The book actually starts with um, a character, Athanasius um, Kircher, um, or, and it's kind of rooted in the very, very earliest days of, of what we might call um, Egyptology in the 16th and 17th centuries. Um, uh, Kircher uh, himself, as you'll see here, um, lived in the 1600s, 1602 to 1680. He's the first character in the book. He's also the only one, I think, in the book who never actually went to Egypt. Um, but in some ways, he's the starting point for our story because he's one of the very earliest Europeans, at least. There were others earlier, uh, but he's one of the very first um, Europeans in relatively modern times to study ancient Egypt and he published a number of books on the subject and specifically on hieroglyphs. Um, he lived and worked at a time when knowledge um, of the ancient Egyptian language and the ability to read hieroglyphs and other Egyptian scripts and make sense of ancient Egyptian texts had been completely lost. Um, he was something of a polymath and published on a wide variety of um, scientific and other subjects, but hieroglyphs is perhaps what he's, um, at least in Egyptology, of course, best known for. He, although he didn't go to Egypt, um, he made use of uh, ancient monuments which had already made their way to Europe, including a number of obelisks, which were quite easily accessible to him in Rome, where he spent a lot of his time working. Um, he made copies of these and he made attempts 
um, to decipher the texts on these obelisks and on, on various other objects, including most notoriously perhaps this one, which is called the Bembine Tablet of Isis, or sometimes called the Mensa Isaiaca. It's in the Museo Egizio in Turin the, uh, today, uh, one of the finest collections of Egyptian antiquities outside Egypt. Um, and Kierke was informed in his attempts to decipher hieroglyphs by his own uh, religious beliefs and his, his interest in Neoplatonism um, and this idea that um, there was a kind of um, divine magical wisdom which had been handed down since ancient times and which was encoded in hieroglyphs and so he used what he knew of Neoplatonic um, philosophy uh, Neoplatonist philosophy to try to try to read meaning into these texts. Um, he, he miserably failed. He completely failed to understand how hieroglyphs in the Egyptian language worked. Um, and moreover, in this particular case, we we now know um, that uh, although this is a very Egyptian-looking piece, it's a Roman era piece created probably outside Egypt by a Roman craftsman in the Egyptian style and making use of some signs which look like hieroglyphic signs, but not actually writing text that made any sense. It's all gobbledygook and Kierke spent a long time trying to make sense of it and when in fact um, there was no sense that could possibly be made of it. So he's important in that he, he sort of sticks a flag in the ground at a time when Egyptology is just beginning but he doesn't really make a, any terribly helpful contributions and um, certainly not um, to uh, our understanding of the language. Um, following Kierke um, I was most interested uh, in some early travellers uh, who visited Egypt in um, in the case of George Sands, who who, uh, who we're looking at here, um, in the early 1600s. Um, this is at a time when very few Europeans had made the journey to Egypt, and certainly uh, even fewer of them had set down their experiences. Um, in, in writing or in published form. So somebody like Sands arriving in Egypt as part of a tour of Europe in the wider Middle East would have had very little prior knowledge and information to draw on in what he saw. And for me, there's a certain kind of magic in, in reading the accounts of people like Sands in that here was somebody who was really only going with the knowledge that he could draw from classical sources, from the Bible, from a handful of, of texts like that, which were themselves already centuries and centuries old, um, and to some extent garbled in, in what they, um, what the writers knew of, uh, of an even older Egypt. And so he was among the first, Sands and people like him, were among the first to try to reconcile these already very old, um, and uh, only partially accurate texts with what the situation was really on the ground. So he, he was going with him, uh, he was bringing with him a kind of knowledge that there were places in, in the ancient past, places like Alexandria, Memphis, Thebes, um, which loomed large in these ancient accounts, but which he had no way of knowing had survived to any extent. Um, and so he was he was one of the first to sort of try to, 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 to bring together these two sources, the ancient textual, and, um, and the more archaeological in terms of what was on the ground. And he made a number of uh, drawings, which to us seem sort of amusing for their um, being kind of very much of their time, not sort of scientifically inaccurate in, in any great sense, but nonetheless capturing um, something of what he saw. Um, his descriptions also with um, written in rather to us florid um, language um, are, are quite compelling um, as well. For example, of the pyramids he wrote full west of the city, that would be the city of um, Cairo, um, the capital of Egypt by his time, close upon those deserts, aloft on a rocky level adjoining to the valley, stand those three barbarous pyramids, um, the barbarous monuments of prodigality and vainglory, so universally celebrated. The name is derived from a flame of fire in regard of their shape, broad below and sharp above like a pointed diamond as if anybody would, would need it explained to them what a pyramid shape was. Um, anyway, this is of course um, supported by his, um, his glorious drawing, uh, which we see here on the right. Um, not far off from there, of, of the pyramids, he says, and the Colossus doth stand unto the mouth consisting of the natural rock, as if for, the purpose, for such a purpose advanced by nature. The rest of huge flat stones laid thereupon, wrought altogether into the form of an Ethiopian woman, 
by a sphinx, and he's talking about the great sphinx here, the Egyptians in their hieroglyphics presented an harlot, having an amiable and alluring face, but with all the tyranny and rapacity of a lion exercised over the poor, heartbroken and voluntarily perishing lover. Um, so he captured for his audience back home the fact that there was this colossal statue of a sphinx, human headed with a lion's body, although most of it was buried in his day. And um, he was mistaken in thinking that this was an Ethiopian woman. Of course, we now believe that um, the human head has the form of the fourth dynasty king, Caius Ra, but nonetheless, it's a, an amusing little tale that he tells here. Um, Sands and others were also looking for Memphis, which prior to Alexandria, which was founded by Alexander the Great um, towards the end of the fourth century BC, um, Egypt's capital for most of uh, its uh, almost 3000 year history up to this point had been at Memphis at the boundary of the Nile Valley and the Nile Delta region. Um, it was a great city, so the classical authors tell us, and um, uh, Sands and others would have had access to descriptions of it, uh, and yet they found little trace of, of the ancient city. Sands thought he was in the right place, um, and indeed almost certainly was, uh, and he says of this uh, location, the most pregnant proof, i.e. that he was in the right uh, area of Memphis, here are, are the mummies lying in place where many generations have had their sepultures, uh, that is tombs, not far above Memphis, near the brow of the Libyan desert and straightening of the mountains from Cairo, well nigh 20 miles. And that matched classical uh, descriptions of the location. Nor likely it is that they would have so far carried their dead, having as convenient a place adjoining to the city. And he, in this case, includes drawings of a number of, um, of objects which don't look very Egyptian to our trained Egyptologists eyes these days but nonetheless are uh, we can see images of human human forms with animal heads clearly representations of Egyptian gods. Under every one or wheresoever lie st stones not natural to the place by removing the same descents are discovered like the narrow mouths of wells leading into long vaults hewn out of the rock with pillars of the same between every arch, the corpses lie ranked by one another, shrouded in a number of folds of linen, swathed with the bands of the same, the breasts of diverse being stained with hieroglyphical characters. And we don't know exactly where Sands was at this point. Um, it seemed very likely that he was at Saqqara, the ancient cemetery city uh, attached to the capital city of Memphis. And he was most probably wandering in and out of the, what we now know are hundreds of tombs um, in the area, most probably um, prior to their having emptied of their contents, um, human remains, coffins and other burial equipment. So he was seeing um, an immense amount of archaeological material and recording it to some extent, but not to the extent that we are able to recognise individual monuments or individual objects. Nonetheless, this sort of idea that at this time you could see so much of this material in situ uh, is for... Um, Egyptologists like me who are much more familiar with the sites having been rather emptied as it were of um, in situ material like this, quite magical. Um, Sands was followed by a number of travellers. Um, I just want to highlight here Richard Pocock, um, an English uh, clergyman and, and, and traveller of the 1700s uh, who visited Egypt again, again at a time when there were very few accounts available. Sands' own account would have been one of the few. And Pocock um, travelled further than Sands did. Um, he made it um, up the Nile Valley as far as Aswan, the, the traditional frontier of, southern frontier of ancient Egypt, drawing and sketching and describing things as he went. And the drawing we see on the right hand side here is his attempt to convey in um, visual form the Valley of the Kings. It looks nothing like the Valley of the Kings really does, but it, it's kind of got the main elements in that there's a there's a, a mountain which we uh, which we know is the Gurn, um, overlooking um, a, a dry sort of desert, rocky landscape, um, with doors leading off in all directions from the sides. This is those are the basic elements of the geography, even if um, he hasn't really captured the the visual um, appearance of the of the valley in any way. And the same can be said of this um, rather splendid drawing of the Theban necropolis. Again, the elements are here. He's got the the low uh, desert. Um, the low hills, the higher hills, mountains and wadis beyond and, and doorways um, appearing in the sides of the hills, these being the entrances to rock cut tombs, um, a couple of monuments down below in the plain, which must be the Ramesseum 
and the Temple of Medina Harbu to New Kingdom Memorial Temples and the Colossi of Memnon, um, it's two statues of Amenhotep III, which we see at the bottom here. So all the sort of main elements are here, but again, it's a rather a more sort of schematic drawing than anything that captures the visual reality. Um, the same can, perhaps can be said of his rather more detailed drawing of the Colossus of Memnon, which has a more classical uh, uh, appearance, which would have been more familiar to his readers, but doesn't really convey the sense of the style of Egyptian art in the way we, we might expect. Um, as I say, these travellers and uh, were, were visiting Egypt at a time when it had hardly visit, been visited by any Europeans in modern times, and it was relatively untouched at this point by European intervention, by the modernisation that was going to characterise the Egyptian government's own um, approach to the country in the 19th and 20th centuries. Um, and so sites like Alexandria, which we see here, were untouched in, in some sense. They obviously hadn't preserved um, ancient uh, remains, ancient cities, as in this case, um, entirely, but there was a rather more preserved and rather more in situ than we would find today. Luigi Mayer, um, an Italian artist, is one who captured views particularly of Alexandria better than perhaps anybody else. And what we're looking at here is the coastline, the Mediterranean coastline. This is um, the city of Alexandria, which is where most, almost all Egyptologists and others arrived uh, in Egypt from Europe until the advent of air travel. So Alexandria would have been the first of the ancient cities that, um, that most people encountered. And the most striking monument on the landscape, at least the first they would have seen from the shoreline, would be this great obelisk with another um, fallen just in front of it and to the, to the right here in Mayer's drawing. And um, these are the two obelisks, um, both e even today given the name Cleopatra's Needle. And they appear in the drawings of a number of uh, of artists and travellers, including Vivon Denon, who we'll see a bit more of in just a second. Um, they are the obelisks now in Central Park uh, in New York, the other one on the banks of the Thames in London, having been moved to those places um, in the later 19th century. So that um, surviving trace of ancient Alexandria disappeared from the landscape a few decades after, after Mayer was there. And believe it or not, um, Napoleon, um, it plays quite an important part in the history of Egyptology. We see him here in this rather splendid painting by Jacques-Louis David. Um, and uh, also, if not in person, then um, in the form of his armies, in this splendid um, painting, a uh, very grand uh, painting of the so-called Battle of the Pyramids, um, which is the point at which Napoleon's armies, having invaded the country in 1798, engaged um, the armies of the Mamluk class um, of soldiers who had been ruling Egypt um, as a part of the Ottoman Empire um, up until Napoleon's arrival. They were his principal uh, rival. They were not uh, descended from Egyptians, so in that sense they weren't um, regarded as sort of proper Egyptians within the country. Um, uh, and they were swiftly um, defeated by Napoleon's um, armies. Now, Napoleon, or somebody on his behalf, had the um, good sense, the vision, to take with the expedition a, a core of scientists and artists to make a description de l'Egypte, um, a description of the country, its natural environment and its built environment, both modern monuments and ancient. And they, uh, they achieved this despite, at least in the early stages of the expedition, a, a more or less a full-scale war. Um, unfolding before them. And what they produced, although it wasn't published in full for another couple of decades, was a landmark in Egyptology, the first um, by far and away the most comprehensive survey of the ancient sites and monuments along with the natural landscape and the more modern buildings. Um, and it became uh, a, 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 the most comprehensive tool available to people interested in the study of um, the surviving monuments, the monuments on the ground, the archaeology, in other words, of Egypt. Um, the character in, uh, in my book who represents the expedition more than anybody else is Dominic Vivon Denon, whose drawing of the obelisk in Alexandria we, we just saw. Um, he was among the leading scholars uh, in the expedition and also the first to publish his own private account, um, which came out only a matter of um, three or four years after the expedition 
um, first arrived in Egypt and included a number of his own his own drawings. So his was a kind of forerunner, if you like, of the description proper, um, a good record of the sites and monuments, um, both in uh, visual form and in his descriptions. Um, and he captured the sites as the description did um, at this crucial moment, just before Egypt begins to modernise dramatically and just before archaeologists um, began, frankly, treasure hunting and starting to tear up sites and monuments in the hope of carting things off to museums back home. So he captured, for example, the Luxor Temple, which we see here, um, at a time when it was still um, encumbered by metres worth of, of debris. You can see a couple of colossal statues by the entranceway to the first pylon um, leading in, to the interior of the temple here, with the sand almost up to the to the shoulders. Um, incidentally, there are two obelisks as well, as you'll notice in this photograph. There is only one to this day. The one to the right was removed a few decades after this time in the 1830s to Paris, where it um, now stands in the Place de la Concorde and is also sometimes given the name um, Cleopatra's uh, Needle. Um, the Luxor Temple was cleared of its debris in the 1870s um, and so you know now uh, it's possible to, to, to walk on the old uh, ancient floor but at this time the floor was still buried some, um, uh, some metres beneath uh, the existing floor level. So th these, these drawings of Denon and others on the expedition and others uh, represented elsewhere in, in the book are an incredibly important record um, of sites in the situation they were found in by these very earliest travellers. And in some cases, um, not only have these monuments changed dramatically in their, in their appearance, the situation, some of them have disappeared entirely. So this is um, a ruins, the ruins of a temple at um, uh, Hermopolis, um, close to the modern village of El Ashmunain. This has now disappeared um, completely. The Temple of Antiopolis, which is in the region of Asyut, was swept away by um, the Nile. The Nile runs very close to this particular site. Um, a number of the columns, which were seen standing here at the time of the description, or the time of the expedition, um, uh, had fallen, uh, fallen down a few years later, and the temple had completely disappeared by the 1820s. And there are a number of sites like this, which were recorded as still standing to some considerable extent at the beginning of the 19th century, which within a few decades um, had been lost entirely. Um, one of the um, drivers for the dramatic change in the landscape in the, in the 19th century is, as I've already mentioned, um, archaeological digging. And this was done usually at the behest of um, the British and French governments by a number of agents, perhaps the best known of whom is Giovanni Battista Belzoni, um, an Italian um, strongman and sort of logistics expert, somebody who was expert in moving very large heavy things who unsurprisingly when he arrived in Egypt trying to sell an ir irrigation system to the government incidentally, he failed in that but he fell into the circle of the British consul, a man called Henry Salt, who needed somebody to move large objects so that he could start carting off um, archaeological material for his collection, um, which was um, ultimately going to make its way into some of the major European museums, including those in Britain, but also elsewhere, particularly um, France and Italy. And Belzoni, Belzoni's first great achievement was in moving um, this colossal bust of Ramesses II, which you see in Belzoni's drawing on the right here and in a photograph taken in the British Museum, um, where it still stands to this day. It's, it's given the name the Younger Memnon because it's a slightly smaller statue of the king that the, um, these early explorers believed to be the, um, the classical king of myth, the Ethiopian Memnon. It's actually Ramesses II, um, but the statue still has this, um, has this name. Um, people believed that it was impossible to move this. It was much too big, but Bell's only achieved it with, um, with not too much difficulty um, and established themselves in, in so doing as the great sort of expert in doing this kind of thing. Um, for archaeology. And um, although uh, the bust of the Younger Memnon is one of the most famous things that he moved, there are a number of other very, very large um, uh, pieces of sculpture in London and elsewhere which were moved as a result of Belzoni's genius for doing such things. And two of the most obvious are these um, two parts of the same statue, um, uh, a forearm and, and kind of clenched fist and the head um, of either Amenhotep III or Tuthmosis IV, depending on who you speak to, it's thought that this 
um, uh, fragmentary colossal statue which is still more or less in situ at Karnak um, in the moot enclosure is the statue to which the arm and the head belong. So this is quite um, a good example of the way in which um, pieces like this which until the 19th century would have been perhaps broken and scattered around a site but still essentially in the same place have now been scattered around the world. Um, Belzoni was also the discoverer of um, a number of monuments, most famously in the Valley of the Kings. Um, he, he had quite a nose as an archaeologist, actually, whatever you think of, um, of what he was doing. He, he had a nose for discovery. And um, at, at the time he was first in Egypt, there were around about a dozen tombs in the Valley of the Kings, which had essentially been open since antiquity. Um, so they had been recorded by classical writers and it was very possible at any time between then um, and the present day, the modern, the modern day, Belzoni's time, um, to, to, to go to the valley and to, and to enter these tombs to see the beautiful decoration. But there were only uh, around a dozen or so and the classical sources um, made it clear that there, there were at one time many more. Um, and Belzoni took it upon himself to see if this uh, was true and began digging in the valley and found a number of tombs, including those of Ai in the Western Valley, the successor of Tutankhamun, Ramesses I, the founder of um, the 19th dynasty, but neither of these were as spectacular a discovery as he wanted. So he kept going and a little way up the same branch uh, of the main part of the valley from the tomb of Ramesses I, he found what is not quite the largest but almost and um, the largest tomb in the valley and, and and probably the one that most would, would say is the most beautifully decorated the tomb of seti the first the second king of uh, the 19th dynasty and a very great and uh, long-lived uh, warrior and great builder and um, this was known as Belzoni's tomb for some time after that although we know it better by the name of its its builder now um, he also brought away the lid of the sarcophagus of Ramesses III, that's now um, in the collections of the Fitzwilliam Museum in Cambridge. Belzoni wasn't the only one doing this kind of thing, of course, and he was essentially operating on behalf of Henry Salt, operating on behalf of the British government. Um, Salt had a, a French rival, actually an Italian, um, Drovetti, who, Bernardino Drovetti, who was working for the French. He was the principal French representative in the country and Drovetti also had a number of agents working for him including a guy called Jean-Jacques Riffo who's not as well known as Belzoni for one reason or another but who also is responsible for the excavation discovery and removal of a number of very very large um, items including this pair of statues of Seti II now divided between the Museo Egizio in Turin and the Louvre in Paris and this very famous statue of Ramses II, which is also in the Museo Egizio in Turin. These are among the finest works of sculpture um, to have survived from ancient Egypt, particularly this last one, um, which was dug up somewhere um, at Karnak. Um, the, there was a great rivalry between the two governments, between the two agents, the consuls, um, Sultan Drovetti, and a great clamour between the two of them to amass the greatest collection, and this undoubtedly spurred the digging on um, and created a kind of feverish um, desire to find things and dig things up and all of this archaeology was done, being done of course with almost no documentation so um, uh, all good archaeologists of course understand these days the importance of archaeological context and um, documenting the relationship of uh, one object to another and um, establishing where in a stratigraphic sequence and um, such and such a find might be made none of that was recorded at all so in the case of many of these um, items we know only in the very vaguest kind of detail where they came from um, you know they might have come from somewhere in, in Karnak or, or Luxor or on the west side of the river but we don't know more than that and of course an enormous amount has been lost um, in in that uh, in that process um, there are a number of stories of um, sort of dirty deeds um, being uh, undertaken by both sides to strike a blow at the other. So we have Frederick Cayo, who we see top left here, advising Belzoni against moving the younger Memnon, clearly hoping he wouldn't be able to do it, um, marking blocks at uh, Philae, which had been reserved for salt with uh, Operation Monquet. 
um, essentially sort of revoking this this claim and um, forged antiquities even were being created for sale to the other side um, all the all sort of sort of low uh, low down doings Belzoni also was the first person to clear the temple of Abu Simbel from its sand um, Abu Simbel uh, is the great uh, two rock cut temples um, built close to the second cataract of the Nile at what was a kind of frontier between Egypt and the territories of the south during the New Kingdom. Um, a great statement of Egyptian sort of might and power. It was only seen for the first time um, by a uh, European in modern times by Johann Ludwig Burkhardt, um, Swiss explorer, also the first European in modern times to set eyes on Petra in Jordan. Um, so quite, um, quite a, a character, quite uh, somebody with quite a number of achievements to his name. Um, but it was almost completely encumbered by sand, as we see in this drawing by um, Louis Adolphe Lignon de Belfort, a French artist who worked both for French and British projects around this time. And the Great Temple is the one over here to the left, um, which you can see cut into the rock. It's fronted by four colossal statues um, of, um, uh, they have the appearance of Ramesses II, but they represent various deities. Um, more or less completely sort of choked with sand as you can see and there's another smaller temple dedicated to Ramesses II's great wife Nefertari uh, over here and um, so Burkhardt was the first to see these but Belzoni was the first to um, achieve um, entry into the great temple and as you can see it's very splendidly um, decorated uh, inside with these engaged colossal statues of Ramesses II in the what we call the Osirid pose on either side of uh, the central axis um, here. This is a drawing by um, Edward William Lane um, now in the British Library which was made a few years after Belzoni's discovery but with the sand still um, uh, in existence up to a certain height of the doorway you get a sense of what it must have been like to enter the temple um, for the first time. Um, although Belzoni was the first to clear the temple, um, the, the first project to begin to document the decoration inside it was um, partly initiated by another Englishman, William John Banks. Um, Banks was a traveller explorer interested in Egyptology, but also a sponsor of others' um, work. Um, he was a wealthy man in his own right. Um, and one of the things that he was interested in, as so many were, was collecting antiquities and he decided that he would like to have an obelisk which was um, found at Philae for his own collection. So he engaged Belzoni um, to, uh, to get this for him. Um, Belzoni managed to drop it into the river uh, when he first came across it, but um, thanks to uh, his own engineering skills, but also moreover the bravery and courage and skill of um, his local workforce. It was retrieved from the bottom of the river, put onto a boat and eventually made its way to Dorset to um, Banks um, Great House at Kingston Lacey and it's still in the garden there to this day. Um, another another example of a, of, a, of a great monument having its, made its way out of Egypt into a European collection. Um, another great watershed moment for Egyptology comes in 1822 with the announcement by this man, Jean-Francois Champollion, a French linguist and scholar of um, ancient Egypt, but a number of other cultures um, uh, in the ancient world, specialist in languages. He'd made it his, um, his kind of great project um, to try to decipher the Egyptian language. He wasn't the only person trying to do this. Um, but he had an incredible talent for languages and was able to read um, a great number of them um, by, this, by this point. And in 1822, um, after a series of gains um, and uh, um, discoveries had been made about the way the Egyptian language and the hieroglyphic script worked over a number of years leading up until this point, in 1822 he was able to announce a system for deciphering hieroglyphs which would allow him to read uh, text. And although it wasn't universally accepted at first, it, it came to be established that Champollion had indeed created the basis at least um, on which um, scholars could begin to read text. And this was a watershed moment and it, it did mean that for the very first time, um, all these people um, who were out in Egypt busily uncovering monuments, and many of them um, inscribed of course, these could be read for the first time. So where somebody like Belzoni had discovered the great decorated tomb 
offset the first in the Valley of the Kings, he did this in around 1816, 17, a few years before Champollion cracked the code. Um, he wasn't able to say um, whose tomb this was because nobody could read the signs. Suddenly, Champollion uh, was able to provide Egyptology with that ability. And um, so if nothing else, um, scholars were able to read um, the names of kings uh, who had dedicated or built monuments in Egypt. And this suddenly opens the floodgates because we are able suddenly to attribute them to individual rulers. Um, and thanks to king lists, which already existed in other languages, including ancient Greek, we're then able to, uh, Egyptologists were then able to put these monuments into sequence and to tell a kind of archeological history um, of sites and monuments in Egypt for, for the first time, not basing conclusions on, uh, on classical sources and on identifying statues with, um, with, with classical mythical kings or gods, um, but on the Egyptians themselves. So um, Memnon suddenly disappears from our understanding is and is replaced by um, known Egyptian figures like Amenhotep III, Ramses II, etc. Um, he was able to do this with much assistance from um, this lump of rock, um, which is known as the Rosetta Stone. It's in the British Museum now, you may know it. Um, it's the most visited, I believe, object in the whole of the British Museum, which is the most visited um, tourist attraction in the whole of the UK, I think. So this is certainly a very um, uh, well visited um, object in, uh, in, in the UK, at least. Its value lies in the fact that um, the same inscription um, was written on its surface in three, two different languages, three different scripts. So two, um, two versions of the Egyptian language, one in hieroglyphic and one in a script called demotic. Um, which is a kind of cursive handwritten form um, of Egyptian and finally in ancient Greek and of course ancient Greek could be read at this point and so the job for Champollion and others was to try to identify words in the Greek which um, could correspond be seen to correspond with parts of the Egyptian text and then to work from there and one of the first realizations was that groups of hieroglyphic signs enclosed in a kind of a lozenge shaped oval um, wrote the names of um, of royals, of kings, um, and so once he uh, had figured this out, he was able to spot the names of kings in the Greek text, Ptolemy, etc., um, and to see those uh, in in the, the Egyptian text. Uh, and this was not the only way that he he set about um, deciphering the language, but it was incredibly important um, to him. It was discovered, by the way, at the site of Rosetta on the Mediterranean coast by na the Napoleonic expedition which was also gathering antiquities. But when Napoleon's forces were defeated by the British, the British seized the antiquities and it came into the British uh, collection. Um, this coincides with a time when there were a number of um, artists and scholars in Egypt who made it their business to make comprehensive records of the sites and monuments, partly with it in mind that they could now um, begin to copy texts which could be sent back home to scholars in Europe um, to increase knowledge of, of Egypt through the text and to, to, to refine knowledge of the Egyptian language. Um, these include people like James Burton, whose unpublished um, uh, archive of such notes and drawings is in the British Library. Same is the case for Robert Hay and the, the artists and architects that he employed. Um, uh, Hay's, uh, the Hay archive stretches to something like 65 folios of drawings, some of which contain up to 150 individual drawings, um, uh, which were never published. John Gardner Wilkinson stands out among this group for being somebody who not only had a superior knowledge of the Egyptian language um, to almost anybody else, including even uh, Champollion at a certain point, um, but also for publishing. So he also made a number of, of, of drawings, of records of, of the monuments, um, but he was also a, a great publisher. And so his knowledge was, was, uh, was disseminated to a much wider audience. I want to mention Caio. Um, he's one of these, uh, these artists, a Frenchman um, in the service of the French government, uh, the Egyptian government and the French government in, in Egypt. He was also a copyist of some skill. This is one of his drawings of um, um, a wall now lost, sadly, from a, a tomb of a man called Neferhotep. Only a chunk of this still survives. It's this part, um, which Champollion himself, uh, sorry, Caio himself, removed from the wall of the tomb for his own collection, and it ultimately made its way into the Louvre. We have an account um, from a colleague of Caio's of, of this, Giannavani, 
uh, Giovanni Dathanasi, who was working um, as a kind of rival to Cayo on behalf of the British, says, I was almost out of my senses on learning the ungenerous manner in which this gentleman had requited me of my civility. Um, Dathanasi had allowed Cayo to enter the tomb and make copies, but not to uh, tear chunks of the wall off for his own collection. But out of pure pity, I forgave him. It's almost inconceivable how he could have brought himself to publish anything relating to facts, which is doing so much discredit. I can only account for it by supposing he did not expect that he whom he had so impudently calumniated would one day have an opportunity of replying to him. The thing is that although Yanni Dathanasi seems to have been incensed and outraged by this, he was doing exactly the same thing himself. And Dathanasi, it was, who removed um, the uh, perhaps the finest wall paintings to have survived from ancient Egypt, those of the tomb of Neb Amun, which are now in the British Museum. Um, the tomb, however, as in the case of the tomb um, Cayo uh, was working in, both now lost, sadly. Uh, whether they either of them preserve any further wall paintings that weren't removed, uh, we can't know, uh, at least not at the moment. Cayo, um, in addition to being a copyist, um, also set about trying to find the location of the ancient um, Ethiopian capital city of Meroe. This is Ethiopia in the sense, uh, in the sort of classical sense. Um, Ethiopia was the name given to all of the territories of the south of Egypt by classical writers, so not quite as far south as modern Ethiopia. And Meroe, which was their capital, was known to lie somewhere to the south of Egypt, but not identified. That is until Cayo joined a military expedition, um, uh, an Egyptian military expedition, um, uh, which afforded him the protection he needed to go on this, this pioneering, pioneering journey to a part of the world, which hardly any Europeans, even by this point in the 1820s, had ever visited. And he was among the first to set eyes on these very distinctive tall pyramids, the pyramids of Meroe, um, which, although they're not quite within the city itself, um, are uh, attached to the capital city of Meroe. And so he was, uh, he asserted that this was the uh, the site of the capital of Meroe. And although, um, again, this didn't, this didn't gain universal acceptance, um, he was ultimately to be proven right uh, when the city itself was excavated um, at the beginning of the 20th century, actually, by a British uh, project led by John Garstang. This is the remains of the Temple of Ammon, at that site. They left their names, um, Cayo and, and others who were within. This is a graffito of his midshipman Latorzek inside one of the tomb chapels at Meroe and Cayo himself led a, left a graffito which was absolutely the done thing um, for European travellers in, in those days. Lots of people with very good reputations in Egyptology did this kind of thing which seems to us slightly uh, off and a little awkward these days, um, but they're nonetheless a record of sorts of, um, of Cayo and others having visited these very far-flung places. This is Musawara Esufra, um, a Meroitic temple site not too far away from the capital city itself. Um, another watershed moment for the subject comes in the middle of the 19th century with the expedition um, of the Prussian king, um, led in the field by Karl Richard Lepsius, um, an Egyptologist who by the 1840s, um, Champollion had died by this point, um, uh, became the leading scholar in the Egyptian language. And his expedition um, intended basically to do the, a similar job to na the Napoleonic expedition in creating a monumental survey um, of sites and monuments, and in this case called the Denkmäler aus Egyptian and Ethiopian. Um, and it, it, uh, it did its job in creating a very thorough survey and improving in detail and accuracy on, uh, on the Napoleonic expedition's description de l'Egypte. And of course, it came with the benefit um, of uh, its authors um, being able to read the Egyptian script. And they produced in a number of text and plate uh, volumes um, some incredibly detailed drawings. And these are, again, as with the description to some extent, these are still... Um, consulted to this day uh, for their accuracy um, and, uh, and they're also very beautiful drawings as well. So Lepsius is a very important figure. At around the same time, shortly afterwards, um, this man, a Frenchman, Auguste Mariette, um, came to have an influence uh, in Egypt. Um, he initially was dispatched by the French government to acquire um, ancient texts for the National Museum collection. Um, 
but he was so successful in this, he removed something like 7,000 antiquities, which ultimately made their way to the Louvre, that there was something of a backlash in Egypt. And by this time, there was a growing awareness um, of the importance of, guess what, not destroying um, ancient sites and monuments and um, not uh, cutting everything away and out of the country and of the importance of, um, uh, of preserving archaeological sites and preserving um, portable antiquities um, in, in Egypt for the benefit of the nation. And so as a, as a kind of response to this backlash, Auguste Mariette himself became the founder of a new national antiquities service, albeit run by himself, uh, not an Egyptian, of course, and also the creation of a new national collection of antiquities. There had previously been a collection of antiquities, but it wasn't really maintained and looked after properly. And in fact, uh, the, uh, the Wali, the governor of Egypt, gave uh, almost all of it away to the Austrian government uh, just a little bit before this time. So Marriott was kind of starting from scratch, but doing things in the, the right way, um, or at least in a better way than things had been done before. Um, Marriott himself um, inaugurated a number of very, very large scale excavations. And by this point, photography had come to be introduced to Egypt. So we begin to see some of the earliest photographs of archaeological excavations in progress. This is a photograph taken by a man called John Beasley Green, an American soldier uh, of Marriott's excavations um, and around the Valley Temple of Kaifra with this, the head of the Sphinx just poking up uh, in the middle distance in the center of the frame towards the top, you might just about be able to see it. Um, these were groundbreaking exp excavations in, in every sense um, and revealed some of the monuments which um, we take for granted today, including the, the Sphinx Temple and Valley Temple of Kafra, uh, which are very much a part of the tourist trail in Giza now, but up until this point were completely um, concealed by sand and debris. And this is a display in the Bulak Museum, um, the second building to be used to house the National Collection of Antiquities. There are a number of photographs um, of uh, the, the displays there. Um, and um, these, of course, feature objects discovered during Marriott's excavations and other excavations um, as well. And even though um, the collection was formed somewhat sort of late in the history of the subject, um, it still, of course, um, found uh, dozens and dozens, hundreds, thousands of objects entering the collection very, very quickly as a result of these large excavations. And Marriott was followed by a, a series of excavators who took the process rather more seriously than people like Belzoni and Rifo had in previous times, making more, um, more of an effort to document the process. Um, and so we suddenly get the production of rather more detailed and scientific type notes. And these people include Luigi Vassali, an assistant of Mariette's, um, who made some extremely useful records of excavations at Drago or Naga in Thebes. Um, Joseph Hakekian, who wasn't working directly for um, Mariette, but operating in the 1850s with a um, more scientific um, geological interest and his um, documentation of the stratigraphy at two sites, Heliopolis and Memphis, is really far, far ahead of its time um, and, and so good and useful that it has been very useful um, to modern um, contemporary archaeological projects even now. Um, his, uh, his drawings are uh, staggering um, for their detail and complexity and size, but, but also for, for how far ahead of their time they are and their scientific ambitions. I can't, um, I, I can't get to this point without mentioning um, that this is also the time, or a little uh, towards the end of Mariette's time, um, and in the reign of his successor as head of the Antiquities Service, Gaston Maspero, it's the time of the coming of foreign institutions and institutionally sponsored archaeological projects. And one of the um, inaugurators of one such um, institution was Amelia Edwards, um, a traveller, writer, artist, and campaigner for ancient Egypt who founded the Egypt Exploration Fund, which went on to be um, the leading British excavating institution operating in Egypt. It's still working today. Uh, it's um, had government support for some of its history, but began as a kind of publicly funded, crowdfunded, if you like, institution and still operates on that basis today. She was featured incidentally in a, a Radio 3 Sunday feature documentary on um, influential women in Egyptology 
in the late 19th century, Amelia was, was just one of a number of such very important um, women in the field, along with Marianne Brocklehurst, um, uh, Janet uh, Benson, Margaret Bucolet, um, Hilda Petrie, of course, um, Margaret Murray, um, and a number of these are featured in this documentary, which I think is still available by the, um, the BBC uh, website. Uh, another such excavator is Ernesto Schiaparelli, who again, along with a number of assistants, his was one of the earliest and finest documenters of the archaeological process, made excellent use of photography. Um, you can see this um, stunning photograph of the discovery of um, a jumble of coffins in a tomb of the Valley of the Queens at the right here. Um, and in some ways, the, the documenting of the archaeological process reached a peak under um, Reisner, the American um, excavator who worked um, principally at Giza and in Nubia, but at a number of other sites um, as well. Not a great publisher, um, but certainly a great documenter and a great discoverer um, as well. And Howard Carter falls into this tradition as well. Um, he originally visited Egypt um, with Amelia Edwards' Egypt Exploration Fund as an artist, um, somebody going out to copy um, the decoration in tombs and temples, but who almost by accident received an archaeological training from the great Flinders Petrie, another of the great um, new generation of scientific archaeologists. Um, and, and he would spend um, some 30 years as one of the leading excavators in Egypt, leading up, of course, to the time um, in 1922 when he discovered uh, the tomb of Tutankhamun in the Valley of the Kings, uh, thus making him probably the most famous archaeologist ever to have operated uh, in Egypt. His, his artistic work um, his copyist work is less well known, um, but features large in, um, in the book here and, and was a, um, in some ways a, um, a, a almost equally important contribution to the history of Egyptology. That drawing incidentally is in the offices of the Egypt Exploration Society um, today and I'm delighted that it appears in the book. Um, just to bring us up to uh, up to sort of the modern day, as I mentioned, we don't quite go up to um, present times, but John Pendlebury, um, great showman archaeologist who worked at Amarna, whose archive is also at the Egypt Exploration Society, plays an important part towards the end of the book. Um, and the last character in it is another EES excavator, Walter Brian Emery, who died not quite on site, um, but um, he collapsed on site and later died in, in hospital, collapsed at Saqqara um, in uh, what turned out to be the last uh, season um, of his campaign to find the tomb of Imhotep which he never did, not knowingly anyway. Um, he is, I think, the only character in the book who is uh, known to anybody still alive today. So he brings us almost, uh, almost up to date. Now, um, aware as I am that I'm, um, I'm already running out of time, I hope you will excuse me if I just take a little bit of time to deal with the history of um, modern Egypt and the kind of modern historical context to what we've been talking about today. This is very important um, in understanding the, um, the development of Egyptology. Um, Napoleon's expedition, um, which as I say represents with its uh, core of savants, a kind of key moment for Egyptology, um, that was a military expedition to take the country over by force so that France could exploit it. And the expedition failed. Um, it was defeated by um, the British and ultimately the French um, uh, army removed from the country by a coalition of British and Ottoman forces. Ot um, the Ottoman Empire um, controlled Egypt at this point. And one of the leading soldiers operating on behalf of the Ottoman Empire, a man called Muhammad Ali, who was Albanian, um, eventually came to take control of the country as a governor um, or a wali to use the um, Ottoman Empire term, from 1805. And he established a dynasty um, which lasted uh, for um, a century and, and a half. Um, and during this time, Egypt modernized rapidly. This is the time when, um, thanks to the presence having been established in the country, French and, and other European presence having been established by Napoleon and then encouraged by Muhammad Ali, um, lots of Europeans were able to come to the country um, and, and Egypt, um, uh, perhaps against the will of its own people, was subjected to this program of modernization and to a takeover in some, in some senses by, um, by, by Europeans. Um, 
uh, aided by Muhammad Ali. Um, and his dynasty oversaw this great modernization um, in the later 19th century uh, under Khedive Ismail. Um, the Suez Canal was built, which was very much to the advantage of the British. It, it provided um, a, an excellent route um, in between India and uh, the UK for trade, etc. Um, but Ismail's program of um, modernization um, was extremely costly and led him to borrow greatly from European banks. And there came a point where it looked as though he wasn't going to be able to pay his debts anymore. And so Britain and France persuaded um, the Ottoman Empire to replace him with his own son, um, Khedif Torfik. Uh, and at this point, Torfik essentially became a pawn of the European powers and particularly Britain and France. And it was clear that because of the, the indebtedness of Egypt to the European banks, particularly British and French banks, um, they were under the control uh, of the Brits. The European banks imposed a program of austerity on the country and this led to a revolt in the country because um, people were found that they were going hungry, economic conditions were very bad um, and this led to a revolt led by a colonel Ahmed Urabi in 1882 but this was suppressed militarily um, by initially by Britain and France although a parliamentary crisis caused France to withdraw um, the British bombarded Alexandria and eventually invaded the countries to suppress the revolt. And at this point, Britain took over the country. And this was 1882. And from this time onwards, although gradually Britain ceded more and more power um, to an Egyptian government, um, it wasn't uh, really until Gamal Abdel Nasser um, uh, of the Free Officers, uh, at the time of the Free Officers Revolution, that um, a, a, an Egyptian government really took control. So one way or another, for the first 150 years, this took place in, um, in the early 1950s, um, uh, and in, in fact, uh, it led the British to relinquish control of the Suez um, Canal, NASA nationalized the canal, the British um, attempted to uh, take control again, along with France and Israel, but ultimately, um, in the face of international condemnation and pressure were forced to withdraw uh, and this took place in 1956 that's the last point at which Britain had any formal political or military um, claim over over Egypt and it wasn't really until that point that Egypt was truly independent um, from Britain and other European powers so Egyptology developed against this great backdrop of colonialism we can define colonialism as a, a policy or a system in which a country controls another country or area. And as you can imagine, this is not really OK. Um, and of course, it, it's not a situation which obtains and to the same extent today, but the effects are still being felt. And so um, in some sense, Egyptology, which arose as a part of this, is still uh, is still a part of it. Um, I wrote a little bit about this on, on my blog. Um, it, it, I'm not going to have time to go into all of the details here, but there's a little bit on my, on my blog if you'd like to take your interest in this um, further. But just to summarise in, in a, what I hope will be a, a couple of minutes here. Again, sorry, I'm aware I'm, I'm overrunning a bit. Um, so Egyptology arose and developed alongside colonialism and actually in some ways helped to reinforce it. Egyptologists wrote guidebooks for travellers, which made it easier for Europeans to go to Egypt and to do so um, competently, comfortably, um, to navigate uh, local customs and practices, to navigate the country. Um, and this, of course, all makes life easier for Europeans in somebody else's country. Travel companies like Thomas Cook um, became established and began bringing over Europeans in ever greater numbers, and even in some cases contributed to the political and military efforts of, um, of governments, including the British at various times. Um, when uh, when the British needed to help out um, General Gordon in Khartoum as part of his efforts to hang on to uh, a Sudan which was trying to gain its independence, it was Thomas Cook that brought the British army um, up the Nile to Sudan. And Egyptology, of course, you know, led to all kinds of things which we might have cause for regret now. The departure of objects, as we've seen in great numbers, to to the West, with without the Egyptian people having any say in it. Um, the destruction of sites, as we've seen, lots of what we would now think of as very bad archaeological practice, and the production of of knowledge, importantly, um, for the benefit and edification of people in the West. 
Egyptological publications um, have almost never been written um, by people outside Arabic in, uh, in Arabic or published in Egypt in Arabic for people in Egypt to read. Um, the three languages which um, are to this day the, the primary languages for publication of academic work in Egyptology are English, French and German, exactly as it would have been at the beginning of the 19th century or um, in the 19th century. So Egyptology in some sense remains a kind of Western discipline. It's more accessible in the West and it's still led to some extent from the West. And it's, it's a part of an advantage gained by Westerners um, uh, through colonialism um, over those people in Egypt itself. So the question is what, you know, what should we do about this? And this is a very tricky subject. And in many ways, I am, I feel not really the, the person to be, um, to, to be talking to you about this. I'm not a historian of the 19th and 20th centuries. I'm not um, a historian of science. I'm an Egyptologist. Um, I've spent a good time, uh, amount of time in uh, in Egypt over the last few years, and I and I know my my Egyptology. I'm embedded in the subject, but you know, you might argue, well, I've got a vested interest in uh, in it. Perhaps I can't do this um, in an entirely critical or unbiased way, but I think that it's important that we all engage with this debate. And after all, I've just written a book um, about the history of Egyptology, and it would be irresponsible of me, remiss of me, as I said at the start. Um, not to ensure that that book is written in, in the right sort of context. So I think it's important for us to recognise, um, and I'm sure everybody out there will know this already, that since the 1950s, the Antiquity Service in Egypt, although it was founded by um, a foreigner, founded by a Frenchman, and it was run by Europeans for its first century, since the 1950s, it's been run entirely by um, Egyptian Egyptologists and archaeologists, and continues like that to this day. And um, many, probably most of the major discoveries um, in archaeology in Egypt these days are made by Egyptian-led uh, projects and um, that includes the very recent sensational discovery of sarcophagi and coffins at Saqqara um, led by Dr Mustafa Waziri um, who has a very active presence on social media so he's a great person to follow if you want to know what's going on uh, in the field. But retrospectively, I think it's important that we recognise the history of Egyptology has generally been told from a Western European perspective and has excluded um, telling the, the stories of, of Egyptian participants who have always been there, um, whether as um, members of archaeological teams or as translators, facilitators, um, clerical workers within the antiquity service. Those stories have not been told to the extent that they should. And there's a growing body of literature on this. Um, one of the key texts is Stephen Quirk's Hidden Hands, Egyptian Workforces in Petrie Excavation Archives. Um, and there's going to be more and more of this kind of thing. Um, and we need to recognise that this is a, this is a gap in, in the history in the way that it's been told up to this point. For, from that point of view, perhaps the most important part in my new book is the chapter on a man called Hassan Effendi Hosni, who I regret to say is the only Egyptian um, who gets an entire section devoted to himself. Um, the challenge um, in writing this book was that archives of the kind that um, uh, I draw on throughout the book um, don't exist for, um, for Egyptian Egyptologists in the same way and to the same extent as they do for Western Europeans. But thanks to um, my friends and colleagues at the Abydos Temple Project Archive, um, a wonderful vast and rich paper archive which was only discovered uh, in 2012 in a side chamber in the Seti temple, a locked room in the Seti temple um, at Abydos. It turned out to contain literally thousands uh, of administrative documents telling the story of Egyptian participants in the antiquity service and um, the team is now going through uh, these uh, papers. You see Hazem Saleh here, um, it's led also by Ayman Damarani and Mohammed Abuel Yazid um, inspectors from the local area. They have a really fabulous website in English and Arabic um, explaining what they're discovering as they're going along. And um, there's no doubt that this um, doesn't look like very much at the moment, but this is an archive which is going to really help retrospectively restore these Egyptians to their rightful place in that history. We also need to ensure that Egyptian voices are heard in this debate. And this again is, is a reason why in some ways I say I'm not really the right person to be telling you about this. It, it, you know, it, in the future, I, I think we need to, to be hearing much more from uh, Egyptian voices than from people like me. Um, uh, but there are a number of voices um, around, um, perhaps foremost among them, um, in my experience at least, is Heba Abdel Gawad, an Egyptian archaeologist 
um, who is collaborating with the Excavated Egypt um, project uh, uh, and a number of colleagues uh, at UCL, National Museums of Scotland, on the circulation of Egyptian artefacts and what this means for uh, the Egyptian people. So do take a look at Heather's um, Twitter feed and also follow Excavated Egypt on Twitter as well because that's really where the debate is, is playing out. We also need to continue to ensure that we can do what we can to um, provide access to Egyptian Egyptologists to the kind of resources that we take for granted over here. That's libraries, archives, access to museum objects, etc, etc. Um, it's still much harder to be an Egyptologist and do Egyptology in Egypt than it is to do it elsewhere. Um, that's obviously you know, not appropriate and something that we need to continue to do something about. And there are various lots of organisations doing things like this. The British Museum has an international training programme for museum curators. The Egypt Exploration Society has a very active programme um, of support for Egyptian colleagues. And the Robert Anderson Trust um, supports um, uh, Egyptian scholars by bringing them to London every year. Um, to make use of um, libraries and collections over here. So, you know, if nothing else, this talk is inspired by, by my, my book, Egyptologist Notebooks, but also by the importance of understanding the history of Egyptology, not just the old fashioned um, European um, story that's been told, but a, um, a more rounded story that involves the Egyptian side of things that bit more. So I hope you'll, um, you'll uh, perhaps have a chance to see the book. Um, if you're interested, um, you can get 30% off, thanks to the generosity of the publisher, Thames & Hudson. Um, you just need to go to the Thames & Hudson website, um, thamesandhudson.com, or you can use the shortcut bit.ly.notebooks.th for Thames & Hudson, bit.ly.notebooks.th. Um, and you need to enter, when you check out, you need to enter the code EGYPT30, and that will get you 30% off. So uh, with that, I will say thank you very much, um, especially for letting me overrun. Uh, if anybody's still out there, thank you for listening. Thank you. Thank you so much, Chris. That was absolutely fascinating. It was, uh, you know, amazing to see that that progression of, of the discipline through time, but also that, you know, kind of at the end to, to see how we're really working hard to try and change things and, and enable um, colleagues in, in Egypt to really kind of um, have the opportunities to, to embrace their history and, 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 and really start to have a starring role in kind of this work um, as it yeah. goes forward and highlighting kind of, you know, the, the, the impact they had as well. Um, yeah. They were fundamental to this whole process, even if they um, aren't the people that we we often hear the names of and um, so it's so, so great to see that being brought to the fore um, we do have some time for questions so um, if you have please pop them in the Q&A box um, and uh, we will um, endeavour to, to put Chris on the spot and uh, <laughs> see if he can answer them um, while we're waiting for some for some questions to come in, I I've got a question for you, Chris. Um, yes. I, I I found it fascinating this this competition throughout this whole process. You know, there's so much. Um, I mean, I guess I guess kind of particularly between Britain and France and and uh, that that attempt at kind of one-upmanship all the time between the two countries. But I wondered if there's any evidence of of collaboration in all of this. You know, did they <laughs> have together to try and to try and move some of this stuff forward? Yeah, um, yeah. Uh, I suppose. Um, I I mean, I, I suppose um, there clearly there isn't enough time to go into all the ins and outs of the story um, today uh, in just in a talk like this. But um, I suppose I, th I felt that it was most important to um, highlight some of the ways in which the history of Egyptology hasn't always been great um, because it, it would be quite easy, I think, to tell a sort of story in which everything is just all glorious and wonderful. Um, but no, you're, you're absolutely right. Um, certainly, f there, you know, there, there, are, there are lots of sort of good news stories um, uh, there was a there was a growing um, awareness um, of the importance of not destroying monuments. Certainly from the around the eighteen thirties, eighteen forties, there were a, a, you know a lot of people at, um, working out there whose principal interest was was you know was nothing to do with sort of politics or government or whatever, but you know but simply uh, an interest in in ancient history. Um, 
it is true that um, projects did tend to divide along sort of nationalist lines and to some extent that's still true to this day um, but uh, there, there was um, there was an, a, a growing awareness of the importance of in, of, of, of um, making sure that I Egyptians could be included in uh, Egyptology from the later 19th century. There was an, a school of Egyptology for Egyptians, although it wasn't universally well received, um, and 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 certainly you know, alongside that nationalism, like I say, I think a lot of people on an individual basis just, you know, weren't interested in that at all and, and, and just wanted to get the job done in, in, the, in the best way possible. So Carter's Tutankhamun project is a good um, example in some ways in that um, he, he essentially discovered the tomb of Tutankhamun while he was almost operating on his own, obviously with, a, with, a, with an Egyptian team, um, but once he made the discovery, he realised he was going to need a bit of assistance, and 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 sort of you know pe people were offering themselves forward. So his team his team was largely an American and, and British team from that point onwards. Mm -hmm. um, but you know even then uh, there there was a bit of animosity between the French, the Frenchman controlling the antiquity service and. Uh, the Tutankhamun team, which I guess was still perceived to be very much a British team. Um, so uh, that's a tricky, that's a tricky question, actually. Um, <laughs> you know, yes, there, yes, there, there has been, and you know, um, certainly nowadays Egyptology is a very international discipline, and yet a lot of the institutions that developed in the late nineteenth century, the French Institute, the German Institute, the American Research Centre. Those still exist today as diplomatic or sort of semi-diplomatic presences in, in Egypt. Um, for some, you know, a reminder of the old ways. Brilliant. It's very tricky. Sorry, sorry for starting uh, off with such a tricky question. Yeah. <laughs> Um, but we've got some more questions, so we'll move on from that. And well, hopefully, hopefully the next one um, will be a bit easier to answer for you. So okay. we've, got, <laughs> we've got a question here from Joy, um, who is asking um, if there were any studies by people from the east, given that Egypt was important in east-west trading. Yeah, yes. If I'd had more time, I would have liked to have mentioned this, and um, I do. I do mention them in the book. Um, what? Well, yes, the, there's a there was a brilliant study published around about 2012 by an Egyptian Egyptologist called Akashar al-Daily. Um, and his book is called Egyptology, the Missing Millennium. And it is essentially a response to the fact that histories of Egyptology tend to start where my book starts, with the earliest Europeans. Um, but there, there had been um, scholars from the, uh, the Muslim world writing in Arabic you know, on all kinds of um, scientific uh, subjects, but in, in, you know, including an inquiry into ancient Egypt and Egyptian sites and monuments and into the ancient Egyptian language as well. So, you know, the story of the decipherment of hieroglyphs begins not, not actually with Athanasius Kircher, but, but with earlier Arab scholars. Um, and, and there's, you know, there, there are a number um, uh, who, who were pioneering in this way. I, the, I think the, 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 what's important to understand is that um, their their work was unavailable in Europe um, for one reason or another. So when when I say that somebody like Athanasius Kircher or Sands or Norden or Pocock, these early travellers, when they had with them, they had access to the Bible and to classical accounts and nothing else. That's not because other accounts didn't exist, but they weren't accessible to them. So there was a tradition of, of Egyptology, as it were, um, elsewhere. Um, and and we are only now, uh, thanks to people like Akash or Daly, only really now waking up to that, if you like. Mm. Brilliant. It's, it's amazing that kind of all these things are happening in kind of different places. We're all kind of exploring things in the same way. And it's kind of finding uh, mechanisms yeah. to bring that all together so we can kind of all benefit from from each other's each other's research. Um, so we've had we've had a couple of questions, um, Chris, following on from your um you know, from, from kind of where we ended there, we're talking about um, colonialism and, um, you know, particularly re um, referring to the artifacts. 
products um, that obviously have been um, exported and, and, and brought to other countries. Um, and Jude um, in particular was interested in the, the, the use of the word departure um, when you were describing the loss of those artifacts from the country. And, and, and kind of people are, are interested to know what you think about whether or not any of those should be returned. Um, so it, it's, it's quite complicated in that um, objects, um, you, I don't think it's possible to sort of, um, to apply one uh, answer to every object, if that makes sense. So a number, a number of artifacts are being returned more or less constantly. I should think there's a constant trickle. There is a department within the Ministry of Antiquities for the repatriation of objects. Um, but in most cases, those relate to objects which clearly can be demonstrated to have left the country illegally. That means by the laws of Egypt and by the UNESCO Cam Convention um, on um, the movement of antiquities in relatively recent times. Um, so it doesn't really address, you know, objects that left Egypt in the 19th century or the first half of the 20th at all. Um, my feeling is that um, it, it would be, I, I think in all of this, I think we need to recognise the problems with, with the past and with the way things have been done. And I think we need to recognise that Egyptology and all of that that involves played out without the Egyptian people having a voice or really any agency. And I think everybody recognises now that that wasn't really that, that wasn't really a very good thing. You know, that, that's not something we would allow to happen now, I hope. Um, you know, not something we would consider to be, a, you know, the correct way of going about things now. And I, I don't think it would be, do any harm. I think it would do an awful lot of good for us to recognise that. And, and I feel as though it's important that um, the West um, is, is seen to recognise that and, and could usefully do so by making gestures such as returning um artifacts and i uh, you know I, I think it's important also though that the 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 driving force behind this be egypt and the egyptian people and i, I think it's probably true that you know there are a lot of people in egypt that w would not say that you know it would be beneficial for every last egyptian object to be, be returned but it, it could well be that um you know the the return of a, a select number of pieces or some to particular pieces just would um be a very helpful way of saying sorry if you like mm. um I, i'm sure that i'm i'm sh you know i speak as somebody who doesn't you know doesn't work for a museum i'm i'm sure that this is a very complex and loaded debate and if you if you work in a museum which uh, contains Egyptian objects, then it would be extremely tricky not to see this as the thin end of the wedge. You know, so in other words, if you give, you know, if you give one thing back, then, you know, what, <laughs> how quickly does that lead to having to say, okay, we're going to give everything back? Um, so I, you know, in some ways, I'm lucky because I, you know, I can say these things without, um, you know, without, without, as as somebody who's independent of a of a museum or whatever. Um, but I, but I think, I, I think, yeah, just to end a sort of long and rambling answer, I think the important thing here is, again, is to, is, to, is for the Egyptian people to have that voice um, and to have agency in that. If that's what they'd like to see, then I think that should be seriously considered. Yeah, I mean, Sue has just asked a question, actually, asking if, if the Egyptian people are becoming more vocal um, about, about this issue. Um, is that something you're aware of? Or? It's a bit difficult to know. I mean, the, um, the Ministry of Antiquities in the past, and I mean the, the you know the last sort of ten years or so, has has very publicly um, a wish list of key pieces which are in uh, major collections outside Egypt, which for one reason or other it would like to see returned, um, and it's put pressure on those uh, those countries and those museums to return those objects. Um, that's that's kind of come and gone a little bit um just recently i've i've heard calls um similar calls again from egypt um those come those come from 
you know, the Ministry of Antiquities, as I say, so the Egyptian government in some sense, um, to what extent that reflects the mood and the view of the Egyptian people more generally, I'm not sure. Um, certainly, you know, I'm in Egypt quite a lot, or I, uh, prior to the pandemic, I was in Egypt a lot. Um, I have a number of Egyptian friends um, in the field. And th this kind of thing doesn't come up that often. Maybe that's because it, you know, it's a tricky conversation to have, or, you know, it's not appropriate. And we you know we'd rather talk about Manchester United than that sort of thing. I, I'm not sure, but it, it's, it, it's not something that I feel as though, it's, you know, it's been very vocal in the conversations I've had. But then, you know, you could say, well, Chris, have you asked? And maybe not, maybe, maybe not enough. Yeah, I think it's it, it, it's like you say, it's a really, really complex issue, isn't it? And everybody is, you know, it's very emotive. Everyone is going to have strong feelings about it. Um, but one one thing I wondered is, is if kind of, you know, we're, we're fortunate now, I guess, that, that we're in a position where we have kind of the, 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 the ability to to move things around a lot more easily than perhaps, you know, in the past when these when these um, items were were um, removed from Egypt and taken elsewhere. Um, you know, it is a lot easier now, I think, in, in terms of our our understanding of how to cut, how to transport these objects, how to to um, move them around and how to engage with colleagues elsewhere as well. So that that, you know, they can go and have, you know, we can display things um, and have exhibitions in different countries. Um, you know, you kind of seen that with the, the Tune Commune exhibition that's that's kind of moving around um, and, and traveling to different places. And I wonder if, you know, if that's, that's got a role to play in, in, in kind of starting to build some of those bridges in that rather than things being static in one, one place, that actually there can be more flexibility in the future with all of this. Yeah, I mean, I think one, one, uh, one other thing to sort of say on that is that, um, you know, that the, the single, the single largest and most important and best collection of Egyptian objects anywhere in the world by a very, very long way is in Cairo. Mm. Um, but the, even then, the museum, the very, the very fact of the museum is a kind of a Western uh, idea, uh, the idea of going going to a, a, a collection and looking at things like that is a is a kind of a Western thing. And um, entry to the Egyptian Museum and the other museums in Egypt, uh, archaeological museums and other museums, is subsidised for Egyptian people. So foreigners pay more than Egyptians. So to that extent, Egyptians are encouraged to go. And museums and archaeological sites are very busy at. Um, at the weekends in particular with Egyptian visitors much more busy then than during the week and I think even in my lifetime much busier with Egyptian visitors than they were when I was first going to Egypt um, 22 years ago it is that I went for the first time um, but, but even even then I, I'm, I have a very great proportion of the number of visitors to archaeological sites and monuments and museums are tourists mm. are western tourists or, well no sorry I, I tourists generally um, and you know so from that point of view history heritage archaeology Egyptology are not not so much of a preoccupation and a concern I think for Egyptian people generally as they are elsewhere for one reason or, or another and, and I think probably you know Egyptology has been guilty of not you know like I was saying Egyptological research and publications, television documentaries, you know, wh whatever form Egyptology takes, it's generally been done in a way that's not accessible to the Egyptian people. It, you know, so that might be books written in English, not Arabic, or French, not Arabic, or television documentaries in English, not in Arabic. And we've probably not, you know, historically, we're still probably not good enough at, at doing what we could to make sure that, you know, Egyptology is made accessible in that way. And if it was, and if, it, if we reach a point in the future where um, we're much better at that and much better at bringing the Egyptian people in and creating an interest and maintaining an interest and making it accessible to Egyptian people then then it then we'll be able to get a better idea of the sense uh, of the extent to which you know they might like to see if things returned or or whatever so I think you know again we've got a bit of work to do there
Brilliant. Well, we're, we're kind of we're, we're pretty much out of time. Um, so there's two two last things. Um, yep. One is that uh, before everybody disappears, I'd really like to um, ask you to share some feedback with us. Um, I've got um, a little poll here. Uh, there's three quick questions. Um, I'm going to pop that up on your screen, and um, if you could just um, answer those questions and let us know what you think. Um, of, of today's event um, and also if you um, if you um, want to join more of the festival activities over the weekend please do visit the festival website we've got plenty happening over the next couple of days before we finish at the end of Sunday and um, so Chris I've got a super quick question for you from Nadia which was can you write the surname of uh, or give us the surname of Hassan um, Effendi is it Effendi am I saying that right um, it, yeah, so I've, I've actually just typed a, a quick response into the chat. I can really see that. So the, the name is Hassan <laughs> FND Hosni. Um, his name is Hassan Hosni. FND is um, is a kind of epithet, um, which means means something like learned man. So his his name is Hassan Hosni, but um, you know, in the sort of full version, Hassan Hosni FND or Hassan Hosni FND. Brilliant. Um, yeah, I mean, it's a kind of general um, hierarchical label meaning learned person okay what a fantastic name um and um i was just going to ask one last thing um which was what's next chris what's next for you and what's next for egyptology you know such a long discipline um you know what what's the next big thing um well i mean you know pandemic notwithstanding i think um Maybe I didn't put enough emphasis on the fact that, you know, there are so many really brilliant archaeological research projects now being run by the Ministry of Antiquities. Um, it's been more or less impossible for foreign archaeologists and Egyptologists to be in Egypt in the last few months, but um, but Egyptian research projects have continued in the field, thank goodness. Um, and that's why we're seeing this incredible discovery, for example, at Saqqara. So I think, um, I, I like to think that, you know, this book might and and discussions like this one might play a small part in just helping us to be aware of um of the past but that otherwise that you know research is going to continue and new discoveries are going to be made um and the more of them there are that are made by egyptian teams i, I think the more will be um we'll find we'll find that we're heading towards a situation in which uh, Egyptology is 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 run by uh, Egyptians and led by Egyptians, um, and and that 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 would be appropriate. It doesn't mean that the rest of us can't participate, um, but the the leadership um, coming from Egypt, I think, would be entirely appropriate. And I, I I'm excited to see how things develop in that in that way. Brilliant. Thank you. So tea being delivered in the background there. Um. <laughs> <laughs> so that's what's in your future tea. <laughs> But no, thank you so much, Chris. That was absolutely fascinating. I think um, you know, there's, there's there's so much more to to find out about this by by reading your book. Um, so please, people, take advantage of that uh, wonderful discount from Thames and Hudson, and uh, do go out and, and buy that book. Um, for those of you who want to kind of catch up on any of this, if there was something you missed as part of the the talk, we have been recording this, and we'll be popping it up on the um, Council for British Archaeology YouTube site uh, in the next couple of days. So. Um, Go and watch it again and share it with your friends. Um, and on that note, um, I just like to say thank you once again, Chris. It's been really great to see you. Um, thank you for having me. And speak to you today. Thanks, Thanks everybody. For, thanks for having me. Thanks. Take care now. Bye.